Our passage on the way to Brest across the Bay of Biscay became an unwitting harbinger of future misfortunes. March 25th, the fifth day after the grand battle for the convoys, passed without adventure. In the thickening twilight of late afternoon, we moved cautiously eastward, having previously filled ballast tanks, cleaned the deck, and tuned the Methox radar to detect the threat of air attack. That night the radar signalled danger three times, and we made an emergency dive. The enemy aircraft dropped depth charges after us. At 10.12 in the morning, an eyed Borchert stretched his arms up and shouted, Airplane! When I saw a tiny black moth dive at us from behind a cloud, I threw the Biscayan cross into the deckhouse. Everyone on the bridge rushed down after it. When the deck was already underwater, I looked at the plane again and realised that you have no more than 30 seconds before another bombardment. Then I dove into the flight hatch and slammed the lid shut behind me just as a giant wave hit us. The U-230 disappeared underwater in 18 seconds, keeping at least 10 seconds to escape the from the bombing. When the boat dived into the depths with a trim of 50 degrees, the pilot of the plane took as a reference point for bombing the frothy trail at the site of our dive. Four bombs exploded near the aft ballast tanks on the starboard side. The explosions raised the stern of the boat above the surface of the bay, giving the pilot the impression that he had succeeded in delivering a fatal blow to us. While underwater, we were surprised that our radar gave no danger signals. We spent more than half an hour submerged, then surfaced, but only for a very short period of time. 12.25. Emergency dive on sighting of a twin-engine airplane. No sign of the pilot using radar. 12.50. U-230 Tayant surfaced. 13.32. Alert. Aircraft. No radar search. Four bombs exploded not far from the boat. Aft horizontal rudders jammed. 14.05. Surface at high speed. 14.22. Alert. Four engines Sunderland. Abrupt rudder shifts. Four more bombs exploded. It became obvious that the British have increased air patrols in the Bay of Biscay. Siegmann decided to follow the day in a submerged position and surface only at night, when the Tommy to detect us will be forced to use radar. This night, however, was little different from the day. We made three emergency dives, dodging twelve bombs on the verge of death. All the next day we remained underwater, moving at three knots, and listened warily to the noise of the propellers of the planes of the British squadron sent to the area that adjoined our bases on the coast of France. We could constantly hear the distant bursts of depth charges. It was amazing how lively the shipping in the Bay of Biscay had become. After dawn the next day we were forced to make six emergency dives, followed by the inevitable dropping of a four-bomb cassette. Each time, however, we managed to avoid being hit by the deadly charge and surfaced. The next day we moved underwater at a depth of 60 metres. Not escaping, however, sporadic and unexplained bombardments. At dusk we surfaced and around midnight entered the sardine fishing area of a large fleet of French trawlers. Their presence saved us from further bombardment. When we heard the inadvertent roar of aircraft engines, we pressed close to the fishing boats, scaring the French fishermen with our manoeuvre. Shortly after noon, we reached the rendezvous point with our escort, but the sea in this place was completely empty. Things did not turn out as we wished. We did not have high hopes for a speedy arrival at the home port, but even small hopes for this seemed unrealisable when it became known from an intercepted radiogram that U-655 was sunk by aerial bombardment an hour before the meeting with the escort. Having made another dive, we began to wait. Six hours later, just before noon, the Coast Guard vessel finally arrived. Sigmund waited until the ship had gotten so close that we could see its captain in the periscope eyepieces. Then we surfaced. The exhausted submariners climbed out of the hull of the boat, greedily inhaling fresh air. Some began to load anti-aircraft guns and cannon. Others, having taken the first uncertain steps, fell to the deck. A barely discernible purple streak on the starboard side signalled our approach to the shore. Soon, in the bright sunlight, patches of greenery, white walls and red roofs of houses became clearly visible. U-230 entered the harbour without a single shot. 
The commander, who resembled a Viking with his long red beard, was smoking a cigar with pleasure. The crew was gathered on the aft deck, smoking and cracking jokes. The men's faces looked yellowed. As I steered the boat toward a concrete pier crowded with greeters, the inner bay exploded into a storm of applause. A brass band played. Our submariners, participating in a combat campaign for the first time, were stunned by such an enthusiastic reception. Even we, a small group of veterans, found it very moving after eight weeks of confronting the storm, the sea waves and the enemy. Directly in front of us, at the sea's edge, stood giant concrete structures. Air bomb proof canopies that sheltered more than 40 subs. U-230 cautiously approached one of the piers. Medium reverse, lock the engines, secure the ends. The crowd on shore quieted. The boat's crew lined up on deck. I reported the formation to the captain, and Siegmund reported to the commander of the 9th Submarine Flotilla. After we, gaunt, bearded heroes, walked down the gangways and stepped carefully on solid ground, we were showered with flowers and kissed by the always resourceful girls from the administrative bodies of the base. Staggering with unaccustomed to the hard ground, we carried our belongings into one of the multi-storey buildings that belonged to the flotilla. I noticed that our fenced-in complex of buildings was well maintained and vigilantly guarded. Some of the buildings were covered with camouflage netting to mislead the pilots of the enemy's bomber aircraft. This military town was to be my home during our anchorages in the harbour. Before shaving, we had to take part in receptions and celebrations that ended well past midnight. Proud of our battle successes and greedy for pleasure, we showed superfluity in everything. We feasted on the abundant food of Brittany, drank a lot of French wine, sang too loudly, joked and laughed. No one reproached us for our excesses. It was pleasant to realise that others understood our condition after our ordeal. In the morning at Aitkes I lined up the boat crew on the paved area. Only a few people showed up for roll call. The rest were incapacitated. I spent several hours bringing them to their senses, especially Riedel and Friedrich, and preparing documents for the commander's report at headquarters. It was only after spending 16 hours on shore that I was able to think about myself. I took a long, hot bath, carefully shaved my nine-week-old black beard, put on a fresh uniform, and had a haircut at the barber shop. Then, in my refreshed state, I sorted through my mail and began to read the letters addressed to me. The first to open were the pink envelopes from Marianne. Judging from one of her letters, Berlin was turbulent. There were air raids by the British again last week, Marianne wrote, four times at night and twice every day. They are terrible. As you know, I work in the centre of Berlin and last week I spent a lot of time in a bomb shelter in the basement under the building where our office is located. While I was hiding there, a bomb hit the building across the street and completely destroyed it. No one escaped. Everyone was buried alive in the basement. What was the point of hiding in such shelters? On the way home I saw the fires, the destruction and the dead people. I cried all the time. On this day, my best friend died under the rubble. I can't understand why we can't drive the Tommies away. This is the capital of the country. It should be better protected. It's hard to say where we'll end up. Goering promised that no enemy airplane would fly over Germany. Where did he go with his promise? I haven't heard from him lately. Yesterday I heard the news about the success of our submarines in the Atlantic, and I thought of you. My dear, I pray that you always come back alive from your trips and find my letters. I think of you all the time and want to be with you. Please take care of yourself. When the war is over, it will bring back all that was at Lake Constanza under the walnut tree on the long, warm summer nights of 1939. I was alarmed. I thought about persuading Marianne to leave the capital and settle, at least for a while, in the province. Mother wrote, Air raids were in the Frankfurt area. Neighbours helped each other in extinguishing incendiary bombs on the roofs sometimes dropped by British pilots. Father works hard and Trudy, now a seven-month war bride, helps her father as his office secretary. News from home pleased me. In my letters to my mother and Marianne, I reassured them that things would soon change for the better. I firmly believed this, despite the obvious deterioration of the situation. 
Enemy air raids on German cities were steadily increasing in number and scope, crossing the line of mere intimidation. Newspapers and radio reports on the destruction and loss of life resulting from the raids were evasive, but I felt that we were facing severe retribution. This conclusion was supported by bitter facts. With great reluctance, I was forced to accept the argument that during our stay at sea on the Eastern Front had taken an unfavourable turn for us. Apparently, as a result of the Soviets' winter offensive, we had suffered a defeat at Stalingrad where our 6th Army had been defeated. News from the North African theatre of war was also disappointing. The British were inexorably advancing in the desert with greater or lesser success. Nevertheless, it seemed to me that these failures were local in nature and did not affect the overall outcome of the war. In fact, Germany made significant gains only in naval battles. The battle for the Atlantic developed favourably for us. Our U-boats, now organised into large wolf packs, sank an incredible number of Allied ships on the front from the Arctic Circle to the Caribbean Sea. March 1943 was for us the most successful month in the history of submarine warfare. Our U-boats sent to the bottom Allied ships with a total tonnage of one million tonnes. Now about 250 submarines made combat patrols in various seas, conducted training passages in the Baltic Sea, re-equipped in ports, were close to leaving dry docks after repairs. Our submarine construction programme became the priority of military production. True, even in naval battles our successes came at a heavy price. As the size of convoys increased, Coordination in measures to protect them between British and US naval combat units improved dramatically. The new type of escort vessels, fast and highly manoeuvrable patrol ships, corvettes, posed a serious threat to U-boats attacking convoys. But the biggest threat was the enemy's aviation. More and more airplanes appeared in the most remote areas of the sea. They bombed with increasing accuracy our submarines on the approaches to their bases or on the way out of them. The threat from the air created a new problem for us in submarine warfare. It was difficult to keep up with the rapidly changing situation. As it seemed to me, the outcome of the war now depended on the operations of the submarine fleet in the Atlantic. It was obvious that the Allies had recovered from our strikes and their combat capability was supported by supplies of food and equipment across the Atlantic. Our U-boats needed to interfere with convoys bound for British ports, as well as Murmansk and Arkhangelsk. We had to destroy the enemy at sea before he could amass forces to invade Europe. And we would accomplish this task. With the help of the entire crew, U-230 was quickly dismantled for further repairs, and at the end of our second day in port was taken over by marine engineers at the shipyards. Taking care of the boat was only part of my hectic lifestyle for the first few days. I continued to draw charts and prepare reports for Sigmund's meetings with Admiral Denitz. The commander needed to travel for reports to Paris, where Denitz had stationed his headquarters in January after his appointment as commander of the Navy. In addition, I was doing paperwork for a third of the crew going on leave. Despite the heavy workload, I found time to think about Yvonne, and paid her a surprise visit in the evening. I arrived at the store where she worked with a bouquet of flowers. But Yvonne was not there. I didn't want to involve the store owner in our personal affairs and, believing that the girl had changed her place of work, began to look for her in other bookstores in the city. But I couldn't find her in any of them. Finally, I went to her house, where we had spent many nights together. Yvonne wasn't there. No one would even admit to knowing her. On my way back to town, I slammed the bouquet against the stone wall, certain that I would never see the girl again. Then, obeying a sudden impulse, I returned to the bookstore and asked the proprietor in French, Pardon me, monsieur, where can I find Yvonne? Yvonne? Ah, Yvonne, he said, looking at me intently over his glasses. Then he said what I already knew. She's not here, I repeated my question. Young man, all I know is that she left eight or nine months ago, as she said herself, with her aunt in Toulouse. But, he gave me a meaning glance, she was forced to leave the city. You see, she was persecuted for certain connections. Such things cannot be kept secret. There was no animosity in the old man's eyes, just sadness. I never heard anything more about Yvonne. 
Two days later, the flotilla commander organized a celebration to mark our return from a successful campaign. At breakfast in the officers' mess, he announced the planned event and invited everyone to attend. The celebration was to take place in the resort of Chateau Neuf, which had been handed over to the flotilla. The commander added with a smile, I've provided a venue, food, drink, a band for dancing. Your concern, gentlemen, is to secure your partners for the reception. I found that finding partners was not an easy task in a town full of lodgers, officers who had never been to sea. When the bus arrived to take us to the gala, the regulars filled it with pretty nurses and secretaries from administrative offices. We, the lone heroes of the sea voyage, were forced to concentrate our trip on contemplating the blooming spring landscapes of Brittany. After sunset, we arrived at the Chateau, a 17th century castle nestled among sloping hills. There was no time to admire the beautiful architecture and luxurious furnishings of the chateau. The palace hall was quickly filling up with guests, and soon I was shaking hands with old friends and fellow students. I hugged my college buddy Fred Schreiber. The gala opened with a bravura march, followed by French, German and English tunes. French food and beverages of excellent quality were served. The meal began early and ended late. The dancing stopped well past midnight when the happy couples disappeared one after another upstairs in rooms with velvet drapery and beds covered with silk sheets. The drinking, which most of us missed dearly, continued until the wine and fatigue had knocked us off our feet, excluding, of course, the few the staunchest. I laid Riedel and Schreiber on the aristocratic bed. Then I made myself comfortable in a soft armchair. After a grand reception in his honour, Siegmann, a loyal family man, went home to Hamburg. On his way, he was to report to the Admiral in Paris. The officers, my mates, followed the captain's example and left for home to spend a fortnight among their relatives. I, with part of the crew, remained at Brest, unburdened by heavy duties. During those serene April days, I was drawn to country walks. I visited the castle with pleasure, splashed in its spacious deep baths, got acquainted with the rich collection of ancient books, went pheasant hunting with farmers who lived in the neighbourhood. I watched the buds of trees and bushes budding in the warm sea breezes. The arrival of spring was felt everywhere. One quiet evening, new friends with whom I was socialising at the base introduced me to the piquant peculiarities of life in the harbour. That evening we sipped cocktails at the flotilla bar, played cards, joked and told nautical anecdotes. Suddenly. Foster had an epiphany. Listen, folks, how about a little party in town? The night has just begun. Let's end it at Madame's house. Let's go to KB altogether. His proposal was well received. It was addressed first of all to me as a newcomer to the officers' companies of Brest. I asked Schreiber, Fred, what does this abbreviation KB stand for? Schreiber took a sip of gin and smiling broadly said, K stands for casino, B stands for bar. A casino bar is a place where you can forget your sorrows, drink good French wine and enjoy the charms of the ladies, all in a completely intimate setting. So, what is this, a regular brothel? Call it what you want, but I suggest you visit it. We walked through the darkened city and stopped at an inconspicuous door with the letters KB illuminated by the dim light of a bulb. The young lieutenant rang the bell in a special way, letting us know that we were the ones standing at the door. An old woman opened the door, jingling the latch. She recognised some of my friends. As the door opened, I heard a woman's laughter and the words of a French song coming from a phonograph, I run day and night. The dim red lights gave the room an appropriate atmosphere. As we piled into the bar, there were cheers from both sides of the entrance. My friends were responding in French. Hello, Susan, Janine, good evening, Pauline, Simone. Oh, good evening, madame. A dozen lively pretty girls greeted us with exaggerated enthusiasm. Madame was a frail thirty-year-old woman with a thick mop of black hair. Fred, noticing that I was looking at her, said, Don't touch, madame. It's against the rules. No one has ever won her heart. You'd better pay attention to the girls. The female residents of the house, all between the ages of 20 and 30, 
were unfortunately outnumbered by the arrival of the officers of the first flotilla. When the general excitement died down, all the new arrivals were introduced to the lady of the house and, according to custom, exchanged with her a dignified kiss. Then the real fun began. The champagne sparkled in the glasses and the maidens swooned in our arms. We danced to the soft music of the tape recorder, sipped fizzy wine and tasted the sweetness of kissing scarlet lips with such enthusiasm as if we had never done it before and would never have to do it again. As the party continued, our songs became more heartfelt, our laughter more infectious, and our maidens more seductive. We consumed champagne in ever-increasing quantities, and soon our restraint faded, as did the laces of the maidens. I danced most of all with Janine, who captivated me with her ardour. I was waiting for the right moment to take her away from the party. Among the services of this establishment, it turns out, was another. The chief mechanic of one of Ballard's subs asked, Madame, please show us one of your wonderful movies. His request was greeted with glee. But, gentlemen, Madame protested, isn't it too late to show a movie? The girls still have to be served. Nothing, my dear, Ballard reassured her. The night is still young. We've forgotten a lot about the art of love while we've been at sea. First, refresh our memory. Giving in to persuasion, Madame gave in with a sigh. Like any mother, I understand your feelings. I put my arm around Janine's waist, grabbed a bottle of champagne and followed everyone up the stairs. The lights went out, the projector buzzed, and a pornographic movie began. An hour of watching the tape was truly educational. It clearly showed us that love without art is like a race car without a driver. After the movie, I came out full of new ideas. Janine was the first to capitalise on this lesson. The morning came when I paid the concierge and stepped out into the fresh sea breeze. Things went on as usual at the Navy base. I did clerical work, visited the dry dock to make sure the repair work was on schedule. I met up with my friends from earlier in the war and visited former classmates at the 1st Flotilla Training Corps, where I had trained in December 1941. I kept hearing about submarine warfare aces who were returning from combat tours. In a year of great successes of our submariners was not without great losses. The growing scale of submarine warfare led to the deaths of many of my friends, including new recruits who, before they could cover themselves with loud glory, found a grave at the bottom of the sea. Weeks of idle life in the harbour passed like April rains. Our pleasures and amusements were but a feeble compensation for what we had experienced in the war. We squandered our lives as best we could. I frequented the places where Brittany's gourmet tastes were satisfied, tasted unforgettable lobster dishes at the local German restaurant See the Commandant, spent evenings relaxing by the fireplace in our country chateau. Then came a night out with Janine at the casino bar. These were nights when the overflowing energy of youth was tamed by Madame's priestesses of love, nights when we forgot about war and duty. During the silent solitude of my room, I thought a great deal and came to the conclusion that the war in the Atlantic was far from over. Pictures of the chaos and destruction that our attacks on convoys had caused came to life. The rumble of bursting torpedoes, depth charges and air bombs deafened me. These were the hours that made me ponder why were our promises us defeat after defeat. The front line was getting closer and closer to the coast. It was now only two hours crossing from the harbour, just west of where the ski and the sea meet. There was a thin line between war and peace. In mid-April, the chief engineer returned from vacation. When I saw Friedrich, who still had not shaved off his beard in the officer's dining room, I came to greet him. Hello, old boy. How was the hero received at home? To the drumbeat and brass trumpets. Did you notice I kept the beard? The kids loved it, so I decided to keep it on. He said he spent most of his vacation travelling and visiting with relatives, so he's glad to be back on base. I briefly and substantively told him about the condition of our sub and the surrounding circumstances. In more general terms, I described our adventures. However, when Riedel, also a bachelor, returned by the evening express from Paris, I did not hesitate to tell him the details of our easy life and elaborate love affairs. 
Soon all the vacationers returned, having travelled halfway across Europe from home to the Navy base. The commander arrived in good spirits. The wrinkles he had acquired after his first combat tour had smoothed out. Gone was the bright red Viking beard. Three weeks of rest were followed by several days of intense activity. The repair of the boat was completed on schedule. In four days the removed equipment was to be assembled. My last night in port was peaceful. I was troubled only by thoughts about the fate of the future voyage, and I tried to distract myself from them by writing letters. I asked Marianne to take care of herself and warned my parents that I would not be able to send them any news of myself for a long time. About midnight I finished packing. The new order required us to write a will along with an inventory of the contents of our luggage. I didn't have much to leave to anyone, but when I signed my will, I felt as if I were signing my own death warrant. I wondered if I would be able to hold that envelope in my hands again, or if someone else would open it to fulfil my last will. On April 24, 1943, the U-230 rocked on the waves in the shadow of her concrete shelter. The moorings had been removed from the bollards. The boat's crew lined up at the stern, facing the seeing-off party on the pier. The submariners adorned themselves with flowers attached either to their navy caps or to the loops of their olive-coloured uniforms. Beneath them, the oily water was whipped by propellers running in reverse. U-230 smoothly set off from the concrete wall and stepped stern first out of the gloom of the shelter into the brightly shining sun. The second submarine, U-456, separated from another berth and went in the keel of ours. On her bridge I saw Forster, an accomplice of Madame's party. We greeted each other with a wave of our hands. Then our boat picked up speed, and the shore, with its friends standing on it, was left behind us. As soon as we passed the centre of the bay, the boat was in military order, in actions, words and thoughts. We acted as if we had never stepped into port, taken a vacation, partied in a casino bar or lounged in the arms of women. U-230 was moving in high cloud cover across the smooth surface of the bay at 17 knots. U-4556 was on a parallel course 500 metres to starboard. The escort disappeared over the horizon. The grey sky merged with the green sea. We moved on, carefully watching the radar readings. Our boat was equipped with a new radar antenna, an improved version of the Biscayan Cross. The bulky cross had to be retracted inside the boat during a dive, while the new compact antenna was welded to the bridge rail and would not deform when submerged. Since we left port, the radar had picked up only faint pulses. When they became stronger, the U-230 made a routine dive. A few seconds later, the U-456 followed. From that moment on, we no longer kept in touch with the neighbouring boat, which went on its own route to a given square. During the night, we surfaced to try our luck at safe sailing and sped up. U-230 roared forward ventilating the rugged hull with fresh air and recharging the batteries with the two diesel engines running. In the distance, the line between the infinity of the night sky and the extent of the dark sea disappeared, creating the illusion of motion in the universe. Our lone black boat was moving full speed between the sky and the sea, leaving large glowing whirlpools, a perfect landmark for the vigilant pilot. As the diesels clattered measuredly, I estimated how much longer we could keep moving in a surface position. Seventeen minutes had passed. Then there was a sharp radar signal. We were being pinged. The submarine had gone under. Our nights turned into days and days into nights. We spent hours inside the dark hull of the boat, illuminated by the dim light of a few lamps. Nights spent on the bridge were as black as tar. We advanced listening to the noise of the engineers of enemy aircraft and looking out into the black sea waves always ready to dodge the floating mines that were dropped by enemy pilots with frightening frequency. During the day we moved at a depth of 40 metres, listening to the distant noise of enemy planes, the jolts of ASDIC and the explosions of depth bombs. After April was replaced by May, we reached the Black Hole, a zone where no enemy aircraft had so far penetrated. 
the radar pulses gradually quieted down and we dared to surface the sea again, to the sunlight. After six days of playing cat and mouse with the enemy, after dodging the devilish ingenuity of the British, which alternately put us in a state of shock, despair, fear and anger, the sun seemed to me a Garancor of safety. The bright light allowed a weeder field of observation. I hoped, relling on my eyesight and methox, that we could detect enemy planes at a safe distance. Passing the 15th degree west longitude, we reported to headquarters that we had made a safe passage across the Bay of Biscay. Four hours later, the base acknowledged reception of our radiogram. In turn, Riedel received and decoded the new orders from headquarters. Move into the grid square VD-95. Expect a convoy heading east. This operational area was well south of the northern storm area, where we had sailed during the winter. I figured that here would be more favourable conditions for torpedo attacks and convoy hunting. The nervous tension we had experienced in crossing the Bay of Biscay received a release. Soon came beautiful spring days, unmarred by the appearance of enemy aircraft. May 2nd. The weather is excellent in the calm sea sunny glare. At 1408, Riedel detected behind the southern horizon, quickly moving single target. At full speed, we hurried in the direction intersecting with the ship's mean course. After a three-hour race to get the transport on the horizon, we leisurely went underwater, having plenty of time until the vessel appeared. An hour later, our hopes of a first torpedo attack were not realised. The vessel was identified as a Swedish transport on the Philadelphia route, the safety of which for the neutrals was guaranteed by Germany. After the Swede was allowed to leave, we received a radiogram from one of our boats. Convoy AY87, course northeast. Sank two transports with a tonnage of 13,000 tons. Continuing pursuit, U-192. Grid Square AYU-87 was between Newfoundland and Greenland, outside the limits of the area allotted to us. We left the convoy to the wolves patrolling this square. On May 5th, U-230 sailed the sea in the assigned square. In the morning we received a radiogram that confirmed our worst fears. Riedel handed me the deciphered text of the radiogram in complete silence. Destroyer Attack Tonum, U-638. That message was the last sign of life for U-638. We heard nothing more from the submarine. Two hours later, a new radiogram was hurriedly decoded. Attacked by destroyers, depth bombs, abandoning boat, U-531. This second distress signal led us to the disturbing conclusion that the battle for the convoys was accompanied by unusually effective countermeasures to protect them on the part of the enemy. May the 6th. It was still dark when a new radiogram was sent from the scene of the battle. Attacked by a patrolman, Tonum, U-438. This third death notice made us furious and perplexed. What caused this flood of radiograms, notifying us only about the death of submarines? But here is another radiogram. Attack from the air. Depth bobbers. Rammed by a destroyer, Tonum. U-25. Fourth loss. Our anger turned to shock. May 7th. U-230, extremely cautiously cruising under the starry sky, intercepted the last radiogram of the day. Air attack, Tonum, 47S, U-5V. U-663. I found the location of the submarine's demise on our softened navigation chart and marked it with a black cross in the centre of the Bay of Biscay. The fifth submarine sent to the bottom in three days, but seven hours later I was forced to increase the casualty figure when, in response to requests from headquarters to report their coordinates, U-192 and U-531 failed to respond. They met their doom attacking that very convoy southeast of Greenland. May 10th, sunny day. We arrived at the assigned square, occupying a small area in the centre of the Atlantic. It was supposed that here we would intercept the convoy previously reported. Along with us in the ambush were six submarines. Many more were in the space between our quadrant and the British Isles. U-4556, our partner when leaving Brest, 
disappeared somewhere in an unknown direction. The number of participants in the ambush was determined. May 11th, another obituary from the Bay of Biscay. Attacked from the air, Tonum, U-528. We were furious and now were eager to avenge our comrades a hundredfold. An hour later we received as a sign of consolation operational instructions from headquarters. All submarines in the Grid Square VD to go to intercept the convoy moving in an easterly direction in BD-91. Attack the convoy at your own discretion. U-230 immediately moved at full speed on a new course. The boat's bow cleaved the surface of the sea, leaving sparkling fountains at the edges. Preparing for battle, I ordered a thorough inspection of all torpedoes. May 12th. At 0400, when I went up on watch, the whole crew was gripped with excitement. At 0540, at dawn, Prugger sent some signal flares to report our position to the other subs. At 0620, he reported from below that we were on the estimated average course of the convoy. I reduced the speed of the boat and turned it westward toward the convoy, which was cautiously advancing. Before sunrise, the eastern horizon had turned a blood-red colour. Only a dark line remained to the west. 06.15. The sun popped out of the ocean in a huge ball of fire. At this impressive moment, I saw a dark spot to the southwest, a convoy. I called Sigmund to the bridge and said, My present to you, Herr Capitan. Thank you, Exo. That's encouraging news at last. We watched the dark spot grow in volume. Soon the commander turned the boat's stern to the black-grey fountains of smoke. On the horizon to the westward, three mast tops grew distinctly. Showing themselves completely from behind the horizon, the three ships appeared to be escorts, minesweepers going in front of the convoy. Following a zigzag course, they approached us, bouncing like marionettes on an empty stage. We slowly pulled back to the east, keeping a safe distance and trying to determine the convoy's course. 06-38 the tops of the masts dotted a large part of the horizon. Smokestacks appeared behind them. These were the transports we were hunting for in the first place. A mighty formation of masts and chimneys rose higher and higher out of the sea. We were in a perfect position to attack almost at the head of the column. Within an hour, I estimated, we would have a chance to hit quite a few targets. 0655, Sigmund's command, clear the bridge, dive. I was in the deck house when the alarm sounded. Five minutes later, the boat dived underwater. The commander, sitting behind the periscope, briefed the crew over the intercom system. We came upon an extremely numerous convoy. Maybe there are more than 100 transports in it. We will attack in a submerged position. I don't need to remind you that this is not a Sunday stroll. I hope you will do everything possible for the success of the operation. Then he turned off the periscope motor, Euro 7 Euro 5. We don't see a convoy yet. Siegman ordered to prepare torpedo tubes for firing. Euro 7 Tehen. I reported the boat's combat readiness to the heavy rumble of the moving convoy going deep into the ocean. Euro 7.16. The acoustician gave us news that upset our plans to attack the convoy in a submerged position. The convoy has apparently changed course. The frequency band has moved to 3-1. The commander, obviously annoyed by the message, moved his periscope up to catch sight of the passing convoy. Sound waves from the rotating propellers of the escorts and transports hit the hull of the boat. It was as if countless native drums were rumbling. Damn convoy, Siegmund cursed. It's zigzagging northeast. There's at least a dozen patrolmen on its right flank. The convoy was moving at 11 knots. U-230 followed a parallel course, remaining invisible to his outer guard and unwilling to attack in full view of the destroyers. The rhythmic rumble of a hundred propellers penetrated through the tough steel shell of our boat, travelling inside it. The commander vacated his seat at the periscope, growling, Take a look, Exo. If our boat had travelled faster, I could have dealt with this convoy without difficulty. I took the captain's seat. Seven miles off to port, a spectacular panorama opened up. 
A forest of masts and tubes of transports moved across the horizon. At least a dozen destroyers elegantly furrowed the green waves of the sea. No less than two dozen patrol boats were swirling around the head and tail parts of the convoy. Impressed by what I saw, I said to the captain, What a power! It seems to be the biggest of all convoys. You may be right, but since we're so close to this armada, our torpedoes can't miss. It was necessary to get a safe distance from the convoy before risking a surfacing to get to the angle of attack. The rumbling of propellers, the heavy whoosh of pistons, the howling of turbines, and the clicking pulses of the Aztec accompanied our stealthy manoeuvres. For almost two hours we went diagonally away from the steel giants. Bolo 9.15 U-230 surfaced. Climbing onto the bridge when the boat was still not completely out of the water, I hastily looked around. Far to the northeast, masts and smokestacks were moving along the clear horizon line that separated the Stoken and the sky. U-230 took a parallel course, expecting to get ahead of the convoy before dusk. Riedel radioed the headquarters and other submarines a message. Convoy in the square BD-92. Course northeast. Speed 2 knots. Strong combat escort. We have surfaced to go to the angle of attack. U-230. E-09.55. A frightened cry behind my back. Airplane! I saw a twin-engine flying machine dive at us from the direction of the sun. We were taken by surprise. Alert! We were blown into the wheelhouse. The boat instantly disappeared under the water. In this moment of maximum danger and minimum possibility of avoiding it, only a miracle chance, luck, which had so far saved the boat crew from death, could save us. Four bursts of dropped bombs and powerful explosions shook tons of water above and around us. The boat shuddered and began to sink with a trim of 60 degrees. As the fall continued, water splashed furiously. Steel clanked, spars creaked, valves popped, deck plates jumped. In the light of the flickering lamps I could see the amazement in the rounded eyes of the men, and they had reason to wonder. The sudden attack seemed mystical. Where had that airplane come from? Its range did not allow it to cover the distance between the nearest point on land and the middle of the Atlantic. The inevitable conclusion was that the convoy had its own air force. As hard as it was to believe, the fact remained. As part of the convoy was an aircraft carrier on which the enemy planes landed after overflying the areas of the sea adjacent to the route of transports. The idea of air support for convoys knocked the basis out from under our concept of submarine warfare. Now we could not count on the suddenness of the attack and the ability to stealthily evade pursuit. 10.35. U-230 surfaced at periscope depth. Careful review of the sky through the reserve periscope did not find the enemy aircraft. We quickly ascended to the surface. The hunt resumed. We moved stubbornly forward, despite the nervous tension. The engines were running at full speed. I concentrated on watching the sky with only occasional glances at the dense forest of masts and pipes on the horizon. White hulks of clouds floated across the sky at mid-height, driven by a sharp westerly wind. It pelted the deck with waves and at intervals tossed wisps of sea foam onto the bridge. Eleven. Wounds. I detected a glint of metal in the gap between the clouds. It was a small airplane preparing to dive on us. Alert! Four bombs exploding fifty seconds later nearby convinced us that the plane was being flown by an experienced pilot. The shock waves shook the boat. Friedrich stopped its fall at a depth of 180 metres, then straightened the keel of the boat and raised it to periscope depth. 11.25. U-230 surfaced. We rushed forward and rushed after the convoy with grim determination. Obeying the hunting instinct continued the pursuit despite the constant threat from the air. We could not be stopped by the constant bombardment. We carried on at the utmost speed, in defiance of fear and reason, forward, only forward, to the hid part of the convoy. 11.42. Alert, an airplane. U-2230 went underwater. Four explosions tried her for strength, 
but the boat withstood this severe test. While we were waiting for the airplane to fly away, our hearts were pounding frantically. 12.04. We surfaced amidst increased sea excitement and moved forward despite the rocking. The convoy moved to the northwest of us. Despite constant air attacks, we kept up with it. I noticed two escorts on the horizon, but the main danger was above. The clouds dipped lower and closed in, covering the last gaps in the blue sky. 12.08. From below on the bridge received a message for the captain. Just received a radiogram. Attacked by an airplane. Tonum. U-89. The news again threw us into shock. With horror, I tried to imagine what would happen to us when the explosions split the hull of the boat. 12.17. Alert. An airplane astern. U-230. Once again went underwater and began to quickly gain depth. Biting my lip, I waited for the bombardment. In 45 seconds, four explosions thoroughly shook the boat. Every second of delay in diving during the airplane attack brought us closer to the convoy. But if we were even a second late in going underwater, the aerial bombardment would have ended our hunt and our lives too. 12.30 we surfaced again. This time there were only three of us on the bridge, the captain, the chief sailor and me. We raced forward, though the thought of possible death depressed us for an hour. 13.15. A twin-engine plane suddenly dropped out of a low cloud, just 800 metres astern. It was too late to dive. After a second stupor, Siegman commanded, Right rudder? I retreated to the rear of the bridge to fire at the plane from the anti-aircraft gun. The sailor took up the second anti-aircraft gun. As it approached, the airplane rapidly increased in size. While the boat was turning portside, it spiked toward us, firing machine gun fire at the open rear of the bridge. Neither the sailor nor I was able to fire a single shot. Our anti-aircraft guns were jammed. The plane dropped four bombs. I thought they were falling right on top of me. Then the pilot roared over the bridge so low that I felt the heat from the exhaust pipe of the flying machine. Four bombs exploded alternately along the starboard side. Huge fountains of water rained down on me and the sailor standing by the anti-aircraft guns. U-230, staying afloat, continued to move forward, cutting through the waves. The airplane, having used up its ammunition, turned around and flew towards the convoy. 13.23. The radio operator informed the captain about the urgent radiogram. We are attacked by an airplane. We can't dive underwater. We're sinking. 45S, 25V, provide assistance. U-456. Prager, clarify the coordinates, responded the captain. Maybe we can save the crew of U-456. The captain's desire to save his comrades was like suicide. We were close to death ourselves but the main thing is to help. Had we been in U-456's position, we would have expected the same. Seconds later, Prager reported, U-456 is only 12 miles away, bearing 15 degrees starboard. The commander immediately changed course. 1350. We spotted an airplane circling four miles ahead. Then I saw through binoculars the nose of U-456 sticking out above the surface of the sea. The boat's crew members were trying to hold on to the slippery deck by grasping the steel cable that stretched from the bow to the bridge. Many were standing in water up to their ankles. The airplane continued to circle over the sinking boat. It would have been reckless of us to approach the U-456 in such an environment. Attempts to save the boat were hampered by another danger. A patrol boat appeared from the horizon behind our stern. Apparently, it was called by an airplane. Now we ourselves could die. U-230 turned away from the plane, escort, and U-456. We hurried behind the convoy. 1422. There's an airplane astern! Again we were late with the dive. A single-engine airplane flew at low altitude in a straight line in our keel. I pulled the trigger on the anti-aircraft gun. It jammed again. I kicked the magazine box with my foot, clearing the obstruction. 
then fired at the approaching target. The sailor did the same. The boat turned starboard, avoiding the bombs. The pilot, forcing the work of the engine, made a circle and began to dive at us from the front. He was flying very low when the airplane's engine rumbled and stopped. The machine collapsed one wing into a high wave, the other wing at the same time striking our light hull. The pilot threw himself out of his cockpit, making a sign with his hand that he needed help. I then saw him blown to pieces by the same four bombs that were intended for us. Four powerful shocks from the starboard side shook the boat. However, we still managed to safely leave the scene of the tragedy. The demise of the airplane must have disrupted the schedule of enemy aircraft sorties. Minute after minute pass it without attacks from the air. At full speed, U-230 rushed towards the convoy. About an hour later, we reached the Angli of Intersection with its courses, 1545. A message from the radio room diminished our jubilation over safe skies. Attacked by depth charges from three destroyers, Tonum. U-186. This was our eleventh loss since the beginning of our campaign. The scale of the naval disaster seemed to be growing. Nevertheless, we did not have time to grieve over the death of battle comrades, which a thousand times seen in his imagination every submariner. 16. Or Ra U-230 approached the convoy. I saw four columns of transports creeping in the same direction in the southwestern part of the horizon. We had to disrupt their course to make gaps in these steel machinations. 1603. Plane on course three to two. We quickly went underwater. Almost simultaneously, four explosions went off, pushing the boat further down and causing the vertical and horizontal rudders to stall when they were required to work. A few minutes later, more explosions rang out nearby. Challenging our pursuers, however, Siegman ordered the boat raised to periscope depth. He extended the periscope, but immediately lowered it down, cursing, Damn it! This guy dropped a smoke bomb and stained the water yellow. Even though our dive site was marked with paint, the captain ordered us to attack the convoy before the escorts could drop depth bombs. The thumping of the Azdic pulses, the deafening bursts of depth bombs nearby, and the rumbling of the convoy's hundreds of ship engines provided a grim backdrop to our attack. 16. 38. The periscope is up. The command sounded. Torpedo tubes from the first to the fifth to fire. Shove. Apparatuses one through five to fire ready. I quickly replied and froze in anticipation. Zygman turned the periscope to see what was happening on the opposite side and suddenly shouted, Urgent dive! Glav May, for God's sake, hide her quickly. The destroyer is ready to ram us. Down to two hundred metres. I was almost certain that the destroyer was about to crash into our deckhouse. As soon as the boat disappeared under the water, the steel hull was hit by the sound waves of the destroyer's thunderous rumble of engines and propellers. The rumbling increased so rapidly and was so deafening that we froze in place. U-230 continued to sink, but she was sinking too slowly for us to escape the dangerous effects of the depth bomb explosions. A terrible explosion scattered the seawater. A series of, of six charges whipped the boat, threw her out of the water and lowered her to the sea surface at the mercy of four British destroyers. The U-230's propellers were spinning at top speed. For a second, everything went silent. The British froze in amazement. It seemed like an eternity until the time when the bow of the boat plunged into the water and it began to go deeper and deeper to the bottom of the ocean. A new series of depth bombs lifted the stern. U-230, losing control, spinning, falling to the bottom. With a trim of 60 degrees, the boat went to a depth of 250 metres, before Friedrich managed to stop the fall. Moving underwater at a depth of 230 metres, we believed that we were just under the bombing zone of the enemy and hurried to get out of the zone. Once again, we were doomed to languish in the conditions of maximum possible immersion. 16. 57. Distinctly audible splashes on the surface of the ocean informed us of the dropping of a new series of depth bombs. 
Twenty-four warheads exploded one after another at short intervals. A deafening murmur came over our boat. The blast wave again pushed her sharply to the bottom of the ocean, while the endless echo of the explosions rolled through the water column. 17 to 16. A new burst of ordnance deafened us and brought us to a standstill. Under the effect of the blast wave, the boat gave a strong roll. Steel hull rattled and creaked, valves opened, rudder bala gaskets leaked, and soon the bottom of the stern filled with water. The pumps pumped relentlessly, the periscope gaskets loosened and water entered the cylinders. Water flowed everywhere. Under its weight, the boat was sinking into the depths. Meanwhile, the convoy was dragging right over her. 1740. The rumbling had reached its limit. An unexpected splash warned us that we had 10 to 15 seconds to catch our breath before another series of explosions. They almost got us. As the echoes of the explosions spread in the ocean depths, the bulk of the convoy leisurely passed the place where our boat had been tortured. I imagined the transports bypassing the group of escorts that had tried to destroy us. Perhaps we should have taken the risk of a deeper dive. I did not know where its limit was, at the level at which the steel hull could burst under the pressure of the water mass. Nor did anyone else. Those who designed the boat tried not to talk about it. For several hours we endured the exhortation and gradually went into the depths. Explosions of a series of 24 warheads shook our boat every 20 minutes. One day it seemed to us that the torture was over. It happened just as the escorts turned to take their places in the convoy's combat guard. But our hope of rescue did not live long. The hunters only conceded the right to finish us off to another group of escorts, following in the tail of the armada of transports. 20 Iwam a new bombardment, U-2 Thea, followed by a second, third. We hovered helplessly at a depth of 265 metres. Our nerves were stretched like a string, skin and muscles lost sensitivity from the cold, nervous tension and fear. The numbing agony of waiting robbed us of our sense of time and appetite. The bottom of the boat was filled with water, fuel oil and urine. Our wash basins were shut tight. To use them would have meant instant doom, for the tremendous external pressure would have prevented the regulation of the water flow. Canned food was handed out for the crew to bolster their strength. To the smell of waste, sweat and diesel fuel was added the stench of decomposing electrolyte. Water droplets condensed on the cold surface of the steel hull from the high humidity, which dripped down into the bottom, flowed through the pipelines and soaked the clothes. At midnight, the captain realised that the British would not stop their bombardment and ordered insulating gas masks to be distributed to make it easier for the men to breathe. Soon, each submariner hung a large metal box on his chest with a rubber hose going to his mouth, as well as a nose clip. Still, we hoped for the best. May 13th. By Aero 100, over 200 depth bombs had been dropped on us. Several times we resorted to subterfuge to avoid the bombardment. Through the side valve of the light hull, we periodically released a mass of air bubbles. The clusters of bubbles carried away by the current reflected the pulses of the ASDIC as a large, compact mass. However, the hunters fell for the ruse only twice, and both times they left at least one escort directly above us. Having failed, we gave up the game and concentrated on conserving our strength compressed air and dwindling oxygen reserves. 4. Boro The boat had sunk to 275 metres. For 12 hours now we had been bombarded without any hope of rescue. May 13th was my birthday, and I asked myself if this day would be my last. How long could I count on luck? 08. Euro The bombardment did not abate. The water level in the bottom rose above the slabs. The water splashed at my feet. At this depth, pumps pumping water from the bottom were useless. After each explosion, the chief engineer pumped some compressed air into the tanks to ensure that they remained buoyant. 12. Liyu Differential of the submerged boat increased sharply. Our supply of compressed air was threateningly reduced and the boat sank even lower. 20. Yi The stuffiness increased. 
the more so because we were breathing through insulating gas masks. The devil himself seemed to be pounding on the steel hull of the boat, which creaked and creaked under the incredible pressure. 22. Bull. As dusk fell, the bombardment intensified. The furious attacks, the time interval between which was shortening, showed that the enemy was losing patience. May 14. At midnight we approached the limit of survival of the boat and crew. We had reached a depth of 280 metres and continued to dive. I began to make my way through the centre passage, pushing and rocking the men, keeping them awake. Anyone who fell asleep might never wake up again. So three to zero. The rumble of bombardment continued, however, without results. We were more threatened by the water pressure than by the depth charges. As the rumblings of the last explosion faded away, there was the noise of the propellers of the departing escorts. For a long time we listened to it, unable to believe that the Tommies had stopped hunting, O four and thirty lay. For over an hour we remained sealant. We couldn't believe our luck. We had to be on the safe side. We turned on the desalinata, which rose on running motors above sea level. No response from above. Using the rest of the compressed air and battery power, the XO managed to raise the boat metre by metre. Then, unable to control the rise of the boat, Friedrich let it float free, wailing. The boat pops up quickly. Fifty metres. The boat is on the surface. U-230 has made its way to fresh air and life. We rushed to the bridge. We were surrounded by the inexpressible beauty of night, sky and ocean. Stars sparkled brightly in the night sky. A light breeze was blowing. The feeling of rebirth was complete. Just a moment ago we could not believe that we would stay alive. After all, death had held us in its iron embrace for thirty-five horrible hours. The fresh, Oxygen-rich air had a fatal effect on me. Almost unconscious, I knelt down on my knees and pushed myself against the rail of the bridge. I remained like that for a long time before my strength returned to me. The commander recovered quickly and we congratulated each other on our miraculous deliverance. Then Siegmund commanded, Medium ahead, course 180, ventilate the boat, all hands to stations. He decided to try his luck again. The boat's engines started again. Since the convoy had long gone ahead, we headed for the place from where we had started to pursue it. The pistons of the diesels pounded encouragingly, recharging our dead batteries and propelling the boat toward another sunrise. The water from the bottom was pumped out, the fuming air weathered, and the collected waste thrown overboard. When the darkness cleared and day came, the U-230 was ready for battle again. Still reeling from the terrible bombardment and lingering in the cold depths of the ocean, we took stock of the battle. Three subs from our group had been sunk, over one hundred Allied ships had passed us, and we had failed to destroy a single one. It was now to be expected that some seven hundred thousand tons of ammunition would be safely delivered to the British Isles. That was terrible. The day promised good luck. Praga's stout figure climbed before sunrise onto the running bridge and fired a few flares from a rocket launcher. I lit a cigarette and watched the rising luminary. The sky changed colour from dark blue to purple, then from scarlet to blood red. I remembered an old saying, a red sky in the morning portends an early death. I wonder what the coming day is preparing for us. Seo 7, 10. Smoke ahead, reported the chief sailor. All binoculars were directed to a dark spot on the horizon line from the southwest side. There was no doubt it was the second convoy. At that moment it seemed to me that the escorts of the first convoy deliberately left us, knowing that sooner or later we would be occupied by destroyers following in the combat guard of the second convoy. Euro 720. U-230 went underwater. The crew, which had not slept for at least seventy hours, tiredly went to their places. Their faces turned pale from the experience, their cheeks sunken, their eyes bloodshot. Wandering glances testified to the realisation that the conditions of the campaign had changed dramatically. Under these conditions, the submariners risked being at the bottom of the ocean with no hope of returning to home port. 
I walked through the compartments to encourage the guys, pat them on the shoulders, joke, encourage them. 0745. A voice sounded in the intercom. Acoustician reports to the captain. From the starboard side of the wandering noise of the propeller, the enemy must be heading east, not north. The commander muttered a swear word, turned the periscope, found nothing and ordered to surface. It dawned on me that the current situation was clearly a copy of what we had experienced three days earlier. 0750. Sigmund and I went up to the bridge and after making sure that there was no threat from the air, began to follow the convoy. Apparently the convoys of transports were taking a zigzag course, moving away from us just as the previous convoy had done. What appeared to be easy prey suddenly slipped from our grasp. Without delay, we began the hunt. A rate. Zero. Airplane on the sunny side. A quick dive made us out of reach of the bombs. Glavme immediately raised the boat and we went on at periscope depth. The airplane took off. After a few seconds, Sigmund folded the periscope handles, waited for it to slide down and grumbled angrily. Damn them, those birds! The plane dropped a smoke bomb. Let's get the hell out of here. Chief Engineer, emergency surfacing. Euro 832. U 230, hurried to the east, away from the thick black smoke that marked our location. To the right astern, a cluster of transports exposed their masts and smokestacks. The patrolmen and destroyers were zigzagging, strictly coordinating their manoeuvres. Euro 855, attack twin engine aircraft from the stern. In a few seconds, U-230 went underwater. Four explosions scattered the sea waves. 09.15. Resurfaced and followed straight ahead. Siegman was handed a sad radiogram on the bridge, attacked by an airplane, Tonham, U-657. Again, each submariner thought about how much time would pass before we too would be sent to the creator. 10.05. Alert! As if by magic, an airplane appeared. The U-230 quickly dived under the water. When the rumble of explosions subsided, the boat moved on. We surfaced and dived several times, dodging the bombs. The boat shook, shook and vibrated under the brutal bombardment. As a result of the merciless attacks, it slowly deteriorated. Rivets broke, bolts and nuts cracked, the steel hull shattered, spars bent and yet it remained controllable. The commander firmly led her to the angle of attack. At sunset, Siegmund's persistence in pursuit of the convoy seems to have been rewarded. Hiding from escorts over the horizon, we were several miles ahead of the convoy, but then the flying devil forced us to dive underwater again. As the convoy moved forward with noise and rumbling, the boat's crew quickly took their places and froze in anticipation. With unwavering determination, I put the torpedoes on alert. My hopes of a speedy attack, however, were dashed. Amidst the din of the approaching convoy, three escorts somehow managed to spot our dive site. An alarmed Sigman commanded, Attention! Dive to 200 metres! Prepare for bombardment! A few seconds later, the hunters dropped their deadly payload on us. The solid portion of ammunition produced an explosion of such tremendous power that it surpassed anything we had experienced before. The frantic shaking of the boat was followed by total darkness. I was thrown back against the steel cables of the periscope. Directing the beam of my flashlight at the depth gauge, I was horrified to find that its pointer swung sharply downward. I saw the two sailors in charge of the horizontal rudders hang panic-stricken from the steering wheels, heard the commander's desperate commands and the shocking splash of water. Thus rose the curtain over another long act of tragedy, repeating the scenes of torture to which we had just been subjected. Up above, where the hunters were, dusk descended, the wind subsided, and the surface of the ocean calmed. As a result, the bombardment intensified. The bursts of powerful warheads made the ocean rumble. We were shaking with cold and sweating with fear. We were feverish as death approached. At night, the poisonous fumes of the batteries filled the hull of the boat. 
half poisoned, we were in a sort of semi-conscious state, and when the sun rose, our pursuers resumed their bombardment, dropping more than 300 warheads. However, they did not achieve their goal. U-230 remained afloat at a depth of almost 280 metres. At noon, we found that the boat completely lost the ability to drift, and we had no oxygen left. Now the choice between suicide and surrender was to be made. In a desperate attempt to delay death or captivity for an hour, Friedrich pumped some compressed air into the middle tank of the ballast. The hissing of air attracted the attention of the hunters. Another explosion of incredible force dragged the boat upward. As soon as the compressed air in the ballast tanks ran out, she began to rise rapidly. But then another set of ammunition exploded, hitting the starboard side of the boat hard and sending it back to the bottom. We crawled up the centre aisle to spread our weight evenly, even though we were sure of the imminent end. Then the U-230 levelled off smoothly at the 300 metre depth gauge mark and began to vibrate in death convulsions. The men gripped rubber hoses with their mouths, sucking in hot air from the filters of the potash tank and coughing continuously. Eight minutes later, a set of six warheads exploded astern. Then all went quiet for more than an hour. There was no ASDIC pulse, no telemetry signal, no sound from above. Having crossed the threshold of survivability, we tried to provoke the Tommy to detect its presence by hitting the hull of the boat with a sledgehammer. However, there was no reaction from above. U-230 began a slow ascent. 1955. Finally, the hatch cover opened. Zygman and I were literally carried to the bridge by the huge overpressure formed in the hull. The sun's rays hit our eyes. An abundance of fresh air and no sign of the enemy within sight. After a careful review of the sky and sea, we got busy assessing the damage the boat had sustained from the bombardment. The aft fuel tank was smashed. Fuel oil was leaking out of it, leaving a treacherous oily plume in the keel. To the enemy, the large oily stain was indisputable evidence of a direct hit on the boat. That's why the British abandoned us. Nevertheless, the boat sustained heavy damage. Two tanks were ruptured, the starboard rudder baller bent, the foundation under the diesel burst, not to mention countless smaller damages. Most of the diesel fuel was lost. Continuing the voyage was impossible. Even returning to base became problematic. At 21.05, Riedel transmitted a radiogram to headquarters, informing him of our condition and the powerful enemy anti-submarine defences in the middle of the Atlantic. He also reported that two convoys had passed us, preventing us from firing even one torpedo. However, the chances we missed to increase the score of sunk enemy ships did not compare with our unexpected rescue. Only the special favour of Providence allowed us to stay alive while many other boats perished at the bottom of the sea. On the evening of May 15th, at the close of the four-day battle, the loss of U-456 as well as two other boats were confirmed. U-266 and U-753 never again responded to headquarters' request for their coordinates. The outcome of the battle was the loss of six boats, the seventh sustained damage that rendered her unfit. This was a disaster, the second in May 1943. U-230 was being dragged eastward across the vast expanse of the Atlantic. Fortunately, for two days in a row, no airplanes had been caught. However, the silence was marred by a number of tragic radiograms from other subs. Their deciphering became part of our daily work. A pile of radiograms grew on the captain's table. Attacked by an airplane, Tonum, U-463. Convoy pursuit terminated. Attacked by an airplane, U-6L-40. Attacked by destroyer, Tonum, U-128. Destroyer, aircraft, unable to dive, U-5128. Attacked by an airplane, we're sinking, U-6426. These boats were gone forever. Thoughts of the inevitability of our own doom drilled into us more insistently the more we intercepted distress radiograms. There were hours, at best days, left before the enemy would catch up with us and send us to eternal rest in a steel coffin. May 8 and 18. At dawn we received an order to refuel from the U-634 submarine in the grid of the BE-81 quadrant, May 19th. The British managed two direct hits, 
U-954 and U-273 were sunk almost simultaneously. The text of the radiogram sent by both subs was the same. Only the places of their deaths are different. May 21st. U-230 patrolled for several hours at the agreed rendezvous point. At 13.15, when we were already beginning to doubt the existence of U-634, an I bore shirt spotted the boat. In 40 minutes, we stood next to its side. I found out that the commander of U-634 was Dalhouse, my old buddy from our joint service in Holland, where we trawled mines. We threw rubber hoses from boat to boat, drifting downwind at the same time. Using pumps, 15 tonnes of diesel fuel was pumped into our tanks. Refueling took almost two hours in helpless, nervous anticipation of an air raid. But no airplanes appeared. It was with great relief that we moved away from the U-634. Both boats set course for Brest, May 23rd. U-230 crossed the 15th West Longitude on the approaches to the Bay of Biscay. Purgatory for our submarines. We intercepted new distress radiograms. A radiogram from U-91 informed us that they had seen U-752 attacked and sunk by airstrikes. None of her crew was saved. At 10.40 we made an emergency dive before the British Sunderland aircraft attacked. No radar pulses were picked up. Apparently the pilot was relying on his own eyesight. This attack was the beginning of a six-day nightmare. Under the cover of darkness, the U-230's maximum speed was only 12 knots. We made seven emergency dives, were attacked 28 times with aerial bombs and sets of warheads. By dawn, the boat's crew was stunned, stunned and exhausted. We hid underwater for the day. May 24th. Apparently, the British were aware that two subs were en route to port. Their planes, including land-based four-engine bombers, seemed to be after us specifically. We went under nine times that night and experienced a total of 36 aerial bombardments. May 25th. Three hours after dawn, we entered the deadly danger zone of enemy air patrols. Moving water in absolute silence, we managed to elude him through a rain of endless, merciless and predatory pulses of ASDIC. An hour before midnight, the boat surfaced, but was detected by an airplane that was waiting for us. During the first attack, four sets of warheads shook our boat violently. Suddenly there was a flash at the rear of the centre post. A fan of sparks sprinkled in the cramped space. We were enveloped in puffs of noxious smoke. The boat was on fire. It seemed impossible to get her to surface and we were doomed to perish. The round hatches of the two bulkheads were closed. Several men with fire extinguishers began to put out the fire. U-230 was thrown to the surface where only seconds ago the airplane had dropped its devilish calling card to us. Clouds of thick smoke choked us. The fire was leaping from wall to wall. I pressed my handkerchief to my mouth and followed the captain into the deck house. The boat levelled off. We hurried to the bridge. Someone threw ammunition for our gun on the deck. The port side diesel engine started. Flames burst from the gunwale hatch. We moved through the night like a burning torch. Finally, the crew managed to put out the fire inside the hull. That night, we were attacked from the air seven more times. Twenty-eight aerial bombs were dropped on us. May 26th. The fourth day of our struggle to get back to port and hence rescue. We moved at a depth of 40 metres, listening to the bursts of depth bombs echoing many miles to the west. This continued throughout the day. At 10.30pm we surfaced. The night was very dark. For over an hour the radar picked up no signals. Then we saw a large spot of light hanging in the sky. It grew at an insane rate, illuminating the bridge with blinding daylight. A four-engine liberator was roaring toward us, firing machine guns. The submarine roared toward the rapidly approaching light. The flying giant roared over the bridge and disappeared into the night darkness, showering the bridge with sparks and blowing a wave of hot air at us. Four bombs exploded, spreading a deafening roar. After each explosion I was thrown upwards. A few minutes later we heard from below, The boat is controllable, ready to dive. 
When U-230 dived to a safe depth, Siegmund broke into the radio room to the radio operator, who failed to warn us about the radar readings. Kirstner, what the hell's the matter? Are you asleep? You almost got us killed. Herr Kapitan, there was no radar reading, objected the radio operator. And our radar is fine. Don't tell me fairy tales, Kirstner, Siegmund said indignantly. The fate of the crew is in your hands. If you make another mistake, we'll be in trouble. May 27th. We surfaced, depleted of power and oxygen. Nervous tension was at its highest point. My body was shaking, my mouth was dry. It seemed to me that we would not survive another attack if it came in the next minute. However, for a long time we were accompanied only by the murmur of the diesel engine and the noise of the ventilation unit. The gentle period of time lasted only an hour. Suddenly the light of a searchlight illuminated the bridge. Its beam shone from the stern side on the starboard side. Again the giant Liberator was descending to fire on the boat. Its bullets passed centimetres above our heads. Then the plane sped off into the night, turning off its searchlights. Four bomb bursts raised fountains of water into the air. The boat shook violently, but there was no damage. We immediately went underwater. When I escorted the commander to the cabin, he unbuttoned his salt-covered leather tunic and, raising his head up, said, I admit, XO, that our radar didn't pick up any pulses. Our methox seems to be in good order. The British must have used a new type of radar. That's the only explanation for what happened. We were shocked. First, an aircraft carrier in a convoy. Now, a new electronic gimmick that allowed the British to detect us without revealing themselves. It no longer made sense for the subs to move underwater during the day and in a surface position at night. We would have to change our tactics and move in a surface position during the day when the enemy was visible to the naked eye. Destroying him in daylight is better than being blown to pieces at night. At 0720 we surfaced, but we're not at all sure that our hopes of a final 170-mile passage to port were realizable. Four Sunderland and five Liberators were sighted. Nine times we plunged into the water and nine times surfaced, continuing forward. At noon we reached the Continental Shelf. At night we informed the headquarters that we would arrive at the meeting point with the escort minesweeper the next morning at 8 0 then we went underwater with thoughts that in this new war at sea we have no more chances for success. On May 28th, at 12.40, U-230 entered the inner bay of Brest. To those who met her on the pier she gave a vivid idea of the ordeal we had to go through. The stern of the boat was mostly flooded. The superstructure was badly damaged. We were not greeted by a military band playing bravura marches. Only girls with bouquets of flowers reminded us of the heroic campaign. The commander of the 9th Flotilla and his entourage were shocked. We were hurried without ceremony to the military compound and led to the reception hall, where the landlubbers did a good job of making our return to base a joyous one. After the reception, I returned to my room, the same room I had left five weeks earlier. My belongings had already been delivered from storage. When I opened the envelope with my will, taken out of my valise, I felt overwhelmed with joy. I had survived. In my mail, I found only two letters from Marianne. They gave me many unfamiliar thoughts. I was distracted from them by a small package from home. Mom had sent a homemade birthday cake. It had been waiting for me for four weeks, hardened and crumbling. But I wanted to honour my mother's belief in her son's longevity. I ate a piece of cake. Two days of busy work in the port, dismantling the boat's equipment and moving it to a dry dock, did not allow me to reflect on the reasons for the failure of our trip. But I had to reflect the next morning. I happened to be on the pier when the U-634 finally returned to the bay three days after us. This time I added a firm handshake to my thanks for Dalhousie's help. Nevertheless, I finally managed to suppress the painful thoughts and feelings. I tried to forget that death had constantly accompanied me during the month of May. With the irrepressible energy of youth, I plunged into the turbulent and changeable life in the harbour. I joined in the casino bar with my friends who were fortunate enough to be back from a camping trip. 
We celebrated birthdays, danced with all of Madame's beauties. She had updated her contingent with several exotic blooms of varying colours from white to yellow to chocolate. Janine was as enchanting as ever. That she gave love to others in my absence didn't matter. After all, it could have been the last hours of love and the lives of my comrades. In fact, submarine warfare was turning into an endless funeral procession for us. The Allies had dealt us a counterstroke of unprecedented force at sea. The British and Americans built up their forces slowly but steadily. They increased the fleet of fast patrol ships, built several aircraft carriers of medium displacement, and a number of transports turned into miniature aircraft carriers. They created squadrons of naval aviation and adapted armadas of strategic bombers based on land to fight our surface and submarine fleets, and suddenly they struck us with astonishing accuracy. 38. That was the number of our sunk submarines in the fateful May 1943. Together with them died many of my battle friends and comrades in training. Until our main staff does not take effective countermeasures, all our lauded new submarines will only increase the number of steel coffins. The repair of the U-230 was expected to take at least four weeks. Since I was granted an extended vacation, I decided to go to Paris, visit my family, and spend a week with Marianne on the sunny Wannsee beach in Berlin. Yes, it was a long vacation, but I was well aware that my life was limited. Early in June, I left by express for Paris, handing over to Riedel. As the train raced through the countryside, I tried to imagine that I could hear the familiar noise of diesel engines, the rumble of exploding depth charges, bombs and torpedoes, the crack of ships breaking apart, and the murmur of the ocean but to my ears came only the forgotten sounds of the clatter of wheels rolling on rails. I arrived at the Montparnasse train station in Paris in the early, still fresh morning. A cab took me to a hotel near the Place Vendôme, which was intended for the accommodation of naval officers. I had resolved to refrain from amorous liaisons during my short stay in the city, but the abundance of aggressive maidens soon put my determination to a severe test. I hastened to the cool halls of the Louvre and spent the greater part of the day in strolling through the Gallery of Apollo, the Grand Gallery, and the Hall of the Caryatids, where, according to legend, quite a number of Huguenots were hanged. In the evening, I went to a fine restaurant near the opera and dined in solemn solitude, then walked along the Boulevard des Capucines, rejecting several offers of paid love, and returned to a cosy hotel room. The next day I had plenty of free time before I left. In the morning I walked along the Place Pigalle, had a hearty breakfast at a small café in Montmartre, and climbed the long staircase to the Sacré-Cœur. I spent the afternoon and evening on the left bank, idly wandering the streets and scraping money in cafés. Paris, beautiful Paris, how I hated to leave it. At 10pm, however, I boarded a train for Germany. The morning sun was already high when my express train arrived at Frankfurt Station. I immediately noticed that the huge glass dome over the railroad tracks had been badly damaged by enemy bombing. The panes had been blown out, leaving only the bare steel frame. This sight was a sad prelude to my return home. As usual, I returned to my family without notice. When my mother opened the door to my call, she looked at me as if I were a stranger. After waiting for a second, I said, Hello, Mum, would you let me in? It's so good to be home again. I noticed that my mother was shaking nervously from time to time and that she had lost a lot of weight. It seemed to me that sadness was eating away at her. But I didn't ask her about it. I thought I'd say something nice. I'm so glad to be resting at my desk again. Naturally, she asked if I was hungry, claimed I looked very gaunt and worried about my health. Tell me. Do you have enough warm underwear? Maybe you don't know, but we gave all the extra clothes to our soldiers fighting in Russia. Your boots, your ski suit along with your skis. Tell me, how's the war going in the Atlantic? We don't hear so much about our subs now. I said she would soon hear about our successes again. And deciding that I would not discuss the war effort with her, I changed the subject. How are you? How's Trudy? Has she seen her husband lately? Trudy is fine. 
answered the mother. Hans was here for Easter. His parents came to visit too. They were heavily bombed in Dusseldorf, and they've gone to the Black Forest until the situation improves. We've been bombed recently too, but not as bad as other places. How is Papa? I asked. Mother burst into tears. With a tear-stained face, she said that my father had been arrested by the Gestapo three months ago. He was still imprisoned in the city prison in Hammel Gas. I didn't tell you about it in my letters, she said, sobbing. I didn't want you to know. Torn between surprise and rage, I got her to give me a confused account of what had happened. My father had maintained a more than friendly and casual relationship with a young woman. She had served in his firm for an extended period of time. One day, the father demanded a divorce from his mother, wanting to marry this woman. But that was not the reason he was arrested. The reason was different. The woman he loved turned out to be Jewish. According to official ideology, such an affair was a crime. And his father had also hidden her from the police. Unfortunately, someone told the authorities that the woman was Jewish. The Gestapo captured both the woman and her father. She was thrown into a concentration camp, my father into prison. My father's arrest made me furious. This was not the first time the authorities had done injustice to him. In the winter of 1936, the activities of my father's finance company and 36 other similar firms were terminated, simply because they did not meet the political guidelines of the leaders of the Third Reich. Father was deprived of his life's work without explanation or warning. He was forced to start the business anew at the age of 46. It was only through talent and hard work that he was able to organise a new business and provide for his family. The ridiculous ideology of the authorities went beyond reason on more than one occasion. I personally witnessed the Crystal Night in Frankfurt in 1938, when angry mobs rushed through the streets, smashing windows and looting Jewish stores in the presence of indifferent police officers. The raiders threw furniture from the windows of Jewish apartments, threw pianos, china, books, table lamps, kitchen utensils from balconies. When the looting of the most valuable things was over, the rest of the things were piled up and set on fire. I remember my father leading me between the fires to rescue a Jewish friend. We arrived at his apartment when it had already been looted and its occupants expelled. I saw the anger and tears on my father's face then. My father and I perceived Kristallnacht as a shameful and tragic event, but we realised the senselessness of rebellion in hopeless circumstances. I realised that something was wrong in the country that was dear to me. But I had to go to war at the age of 19. I had neither the time nor the interest to understand the politics of the regime. Now, however, these policies directly affected me and aroused rebellious feelings in me. I decided that I had to deal with my father's case, even if it hurt my military career. I immediately went to the Gestapo office on Lindenstrasse, which was not far from our home. My naval uniform and decorations allowed me to get past the guards without too many questions. When I entered the spacious hall, the secretary at the desk at the entrance asked how I could be of service. Tell me. How can I see Obersturmbannführer von Molitor? I answered a question with a question, then with a smile handed the secretary my business card and added, This will be a surprise for Herr von Molitor. I supposed that he had seldom seen submarine officers, and even so few whose fathers were behind bars. I had to wait quite a long time to see the Obersturmbannführer. It was enough time to think over the plan of the conversation, then the secretary took me to a perfectly furnished office and introduced me to the chief of the SS in the city. So, in front of me was a powerful man who was worth lifting a finger to decide someone's fate. This middle-aged officer in a grey SS field uniform resembled more of a funky businessman than a cold-blooded punisher. Von Molitor's greeting was as unusual as his appearance. It's nice to see a naval officer for a change, he said. I know you're in the submarine navy. Quite an interesting and exciting service, isn't it? What can I do for you, Lieutenant? I answered him in an icy tone. Herr Obersturmbannführer, my father is being held in your prison. Without any justification, I demand his immediate release. 
The friendly smile on his full face was replaced by an expression of concern. He glanced at my business card, read my name again, and then hesitated. I have not been informed of the arrest of the father of a distinguished sailor. Unfortunately, Lieutenant, there must have been a mistake. I will look into the matter immediately. He wrote something on a piece of paper and pressed the call button. Another secretary came in from the other door and took the sheet from the chief. You see, Lieutenant, I am not informed on every particular case of arrest, but I suppose you've come to us only on your father's case. Of course I did, and I believe the reason for his arrest. Before I could make the great mistake of speaking harshly, the secretary came in again and handed von Molitor another sheet of paper. He scrutinised it for a while, then said in a conciliatory tone, Lieutenant, I am now in the loop. Father will be with you this evening. I'm sure the three months in detention will teach him a lesson. I'm sorry about what happened, but your father has no one to blame but himself. I'm glad I could do you a favour. I hope your vacation will never be marred again. Goodbye. Heil Hitler. Rising quickly, I thanked him briefly. Of course, the chief of the SS did me no favours. It is unlikely that he could ignore my demand to release my father. I said goodbye to von Molitor with the traditional military greeting, and, as I walked outside, I remembered my father's temptress, who had also been imprisoned. I regretted that I could not help her. Only after the war did I learn that she had somehow managed to survive. Then I went to my father's office to see little sister Trudy for the first time since the wedding. When I informed her that Dad would be home for dinner, Trudy cried. Through her tears, she said, We asked for my father's release, but the Gestapo refused to even listen to our request. You can't imagine how happy I am that you're coming home. Mother is in despair over father's marriage plans. The situation is unbearable. While he was in Humalgasa prison, I had to manage his affairs myself. I praised Trudy and said I was proud of her. Then I suggested we close the office until the next day. On that day, we would organise a family party. My sister gave the appropriate orders to the woman manager, and soon we were back home together. Mother was very worried and nervous, but was ready to forgive father if he did not ask her. The latter option became less likely after my father lost the opportunity to see the object of his lust. Dinner time was approaching when a turn of the key unlocked the front door, and my father, unaware of my presence, entered the lobby. As soon as he saw me, he knew at once who had facilitated his release from prison. Silently we shook hands. My father's face had a week's worth of stubble. The Gestapo wouldn't even let him shave. Dinner passed in a strained atmosphere. It was difficult for us to find a common topic of conversation. I spoke briefly about the situation at the front in the Atlantic, withholding the truth. The colossal difficulties of our armies on the Russian front and Rommel's total defeat in North Africa seemed to worry my father more than the trouble with the Gestapo. He told me about the increased air raids on Frankfurt and the relocation of his business establishments outside the city. We discussed many topics except one. My father never mentioned his affair or raised the possibility of divorcing my mother. From my perspective, the most important thing was that he came home. As for the preservation of the marriage, this was a problem that father and mother had to resolve between themselves. Twenty-four hours later, I arrived in Berlin. As I walked out of the station, I was struck by the scale of the destruction. There was broken glass, pieces of plaster, torn stone and bricks everywhere. For the first time, I was not greeted at the station by Marianne. With the intention of going to Marianne's office, I took a streetcar to the centre of the capital. The ride was depressing. Massive bombing had nearly levelled much of the city, leaving construction debris, dust and millions of human tragedies. I felt as if the ground beneath me was failing, as if I were a refugee getting off yet another train. Eventually I reached the place where Marianne worked, which is where the seven-storey building used to stand. But there were only a few ruined walls. There was a pile of broken bricks two storeys high. I left the ruins and looked for the nearest subway station. Then I took a train to the suburb where Marianne lived with her parents. 
As I got off the subway, I saw houses burned to the ground and destroyed buildings everywhere. Death and destruction seemed to follow me around. As I approached Marianne's house, I prepared myself to experience the tragedy I suspected. A pile of ashes stood before me where the house had once been. Its chimney stuck out like a warning finger. Around it were scattered broken bricks and stone blocks blackened with soot. Steel beams had been bent in the fire. Debris of all kinds lay everywhere. There was a wooden plaque stuck in them with the inscription in red paint, The entire Gartenberg family is dead. Before I left, I reread the inscription two or three times. I had lost my ability to think. There was something scratchy in my throat. My heart was petrified. In that instant, all my feelings and thoughts died. They burned up like the houses around me. I became completely insensitive to everything. Another train brought me home to Frankfurt. I spent four aimless days in the city, grieving for Marianne. One night I had to spend in the cellar of our apartment building, listening to the howl of sirens and the deafening bursts of anti-aircraft shells. While I was shaken by the explosions of the bombs, I looked at the petrified faces of the people around me who were used to air raids. When it was over, the street outside was filled with the acrid smell of gunpowder, the groans of casualties, and the ringing of fire bells. These were the consequences of the war. Marianne was the victim of an air raid, and my family was getting used to fleeing the bombing underground. After that night, I no longer saw any point in staying at home. I had to go back to my submarine and fight until victory for those back home who were living a miserable existence in perpetual fear of death. After spending the night on a dark train, I arrived in Paris. The city breathed peace, the hot June sun golden the trees and roofs of the houses. The heat reminded me of the uncomfortableness of the navy uniform and made me think of the advantages of civilian clothes. It was not easy for me to mingle with the motley Parisian public, who somehow or other tried to ignore the war. I noticed that most elegantly dressed Parisians ignored people in uniform. I realised what a gulf separated me from them, who enjoyed all the pleasures of life, and how far we military men, who had no choice but to fight and die, were from the people who lived in peaceful interests. Late in the evening I returned to the military town of Brest and found a very lively Riedel and my other comrades in the bar of the flotilla. I joined in the revelry. The bar shook with our riotous merriment and obscene sea songs. We needed this exuberance to forget that soon many of us would be missed and we had too little time left to party. I personally needed the blackout to forget the double shock of Marianne's death and my father's arrest by the Gestapo. Friends, strong drinks and a broken life led to a sweet oblivion. But I had to do my duty. It was not difficult for me to adapt to the familiar naval routine. Every day I visited the shipyards, strictly monitored the discipline of the submarine crew. Only one sailor gave me trouble. He used to run at night to party in the city, overcoming the fence of the military town. Unfortunately, he often got into fistfights over women, so I decided to send him to the brig for eight days. In other respects, he was a fine fellow and proved himself a reliable submariner when our boat left port. During my brief absence, the flotilla headquarters made a remarkable acquisition. It was found that the flotilla plays an important part in the German Navy, and it is necessary for it to have its own photographer to familiarise posterity with interesting events in the life of the compound. The photographer turned out to be an attractive young woman. A chance meeting with this woman in the morning prompted me to invite her to sit in the bar. As we sat there, I noticed, You have a very familiar southern accent. And your pronunciation is a bit different from Berlin's too, she parried my remark with a smile. I agree. I grew up on Lake Constanza, on the northern coast. What a coincidence, she exclaimed. I used to live across the lake in Constanza. My name is Veronica, but many people just call me Vera. I invited Vera to dinner, and she agreed without a second thought. After the day's work, I took a swim in the swimming pool, which was also a new acquisition of the flotilla. Then it was time for the meeting. 
I knocked on the door of the cabin that Vera had occupied after her assignment. The two of us left the military town and wandered through the narrow streets of Brest under a sun that was leaning towards sunset. We ordered fried clams, shrimp in wine sauce, a huge lobster and a bottle of Beaujolais for dinner. Then went to a small secluded cafe and danced to the music of a pianiste who played all our requests. After that we returned to the military camp. It was somehow unusual to enter this fenced-in place for military sailors and carefully guarded with a woman. From that night on I constantly met Vera after work. One Saturday I remembered my intention to get a civilian suit and asked Vera to help me in my search for material and a tailor. In spite of the wartime shortage of goods, the tailor offered us an amazing variety of fabrics and without cards. I chose tartan. The tailor took my measurements, set a price and a deadline for the suit. I did not feel the slightest anxiety that I might not get the chance to wear the suit at all. With this acquisition I kind of cheered myself up, tried to be more optimistic. During the remaining days of our stay in port there were many reasons for pessimism. When a comrade in arms did not return from a campaign, when the truth about our losses in May was revealed, when a battered submarine crawled into the inner harbour when reports of growing losses became the main topic of conversation in the officers' mess hall, and the horrible pictures of our submarine hell reappeared in my memory. A premonition of unhappiness grew. Worst of all was the fact that our guys could not give their lives dearly. Despite heavy losses, in April we sank only a third of the Allied ships sent to the bottom in March. In the disastrous for us, May was sunk only 50 enemy ships, tonnage of 265,000 tonnes. By mid-June, submarine warfare actually did not bring results. In two weeks, 16 more submarines were lost. Admiral Dennitz ordered a temporary halt to attacks on shipping lines in the North Atlantic. Surviving U-boats had their patrol areas changed, but they were not withdrawn from the front. On the contrary, to compensate for our staggering losses, a gigantic effort was being made to rapidly repair the subs in dry docks and to complete the construction of new submarines in shipyards. The intent was to incorporate imperfect and obsolete types of boats into the fighting. This was to show the Allies that they had failed to break our backbone. In his speech at Lorient, Dennitz assured us that the setbacks were temporary and the unfavourable trend would be reversed by our countermeasures. But in the meantime, we must still put to sea. According to the Admiral, our efforts tie up the Allied naval forces in the Atlantic and divert their bombers from air raids on German cities. At the end of June, I took the U-230 out of dry dock and brought her to the pier where refitting had to be completed. From that time, all our absences in the port stopped. Now the main thing was the submarine, the war and preparation for the inevitable collision with the enemy. That was the reality. The rest, empty wishes and dreams. June 29th. At noon, after the commander returned from a meeting of high-ranking submarine officers of the Western Front, he asked me to come into his room. Take Friedrich and Riedel with you, he added. I have interesting news. Twenty minutes later, we were at Siegmann's. Sit down, gentlemen, he addressed us. My message will take some time, and what you will hear should not be divulged. Headquarters has entrusted us with a special task. The main purpose of the upcoming trip will be to lay mines off the coast of the United States. We will take on board 24 magnetic mines of the latest design and set them in the Chesapeake Bay, more precisely, in front of the US Navy base in Norfolk. I need not tell you the dangers of this enterprise. I demand that the nature of the mission be kept secret until we are at sea. I'd hate to find that they're waiting for us when we arrive in the United States. One more thing. The Chesapeake Bay is too shallow to allow our boat to submerge. We'll be conducting the mine sweep in a surface position. XO, I ask you to secure all necessary navigational charts of the area and keep them behind seven locks. The three of us listened carefully to the captain and rejoiced that the upcoming trip would be unusual. Concerned for the safety of the boat, I asked the commander, if we take on board 24 mines, we can take no more than two torpedoes with us. That's right, XO, only two. 
The rest of the space of the boat will be filled with mines, for the loading of which you are responsible. Friedrich has entered the conversation. How much fuel will we take with us? The usual amount? It's all worked out. The refueling of the boat will be carried out by one of the submarine tankers in the West Indies, the area of our future operations. There we'll be supplied with food, fuel and torpedoes. Riedel, take care of outfitting the crew with tropical uniforms and an appropriate diet. Gentlemen, the captain concluded, I believe we will be at sea for the rest of the summer. On July 1st, we loaded mines aboard the boat. The unusual cargo immediately caused the crew to speculate. Some people were sure we were going to mine a British port. Others thought it would be the Bay of Gibraltar. The most speculative claimed that we were going to an important port on the coast of West Africa, Freetown. The heated gossip brought a smile to my face. It was good to see the crew eager to put to sea, as it were. But the closer the date of going to sea got, the more I doubted the reversal of the situation in the Atlantic for the better. None of the expected technical innovations had arrived on the U-230. It was claimed that our Methox radar was the latest advancement in radar. The installation of additional anti-aircraft artillery barrels on the boat was promised, but they did not arrive in sufficient numbers in port. There were rumours of such an innovation as rubber coating the boat's strong and light hull to protect it from ASDIC pulses. This turned out to be idle talk. The only improvement was to cover the running bridge railings with armoured plates. At the same time, they dismantled the obsolete radar antenna and 88mm cannon on the foredeck. Everything was against us. The British used aviation on such a large scale that the U-boats could hardly cross the Bay of Biscay undetected. In six weeks, the Allies had reduced the number of our attack subs by 40%. The remaining ones had to overcome when leaving and returning to the home port powerful anti-submarine defences. Despite the moral and physical fatigue, we still believed in a favourable turn of events if we hold out for a while. We had to hold out. Two days before going to sea, I visited my tailor again. He had not finished my suit by the promised deadline. I arranged with him that my order would be completed in a fortnight and encouraged him to be active by paying half the cost of the work. I did not want to be indebted to the tailor in the event of my death on the trek. 